Um, but what's the deal with the reading reports? I want you guys to just have a chance to give me some feedback. I had weird feelings about them and my feelings changed back and forth throughout the course of being in college. I attended an undergraduate program part-time at like three or four different universities. One of them was Multnomah and then I got a graduate degree at Multnomah University. Um, Multnomah was the only program that did reading reports. And at different points from the age of 16 to 26, I had wildly different opinions at different times on the fact that most professors had reading reports. Um, what do you feel about reading reports? What are your various thoughts at the time? Any volunteers? Yes. Yeah, for smaller groups. Yeah. So maybe in, in a larger group, uh, people don't care as much. Yeah. So, so why is that exactly? Is it because are, I'm, I'm assuming that what you're saying is that in a larger group, less people will engage in the reading. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Does everybody agree, agree or concur or feel differently? Yes. No, no, because it, it, and that, maybe that's what we need to clarify too. Um, when you're uh, taking your final, there'll be an extra question on there that says, what percentage of the course reading did you accomplish on time? And I don't know if they still do that, but that's something that, you know, for 10 years that I attended Multnomah did, you know, people will write 100%, 80%, and that is how much points they get for that particular assignment. So 20% of your course grade is basically a number that you put on the final. Does that make sense? That you self-report. Is that something that they're still doing? Yes. Yeah, I figured they were. Um, so yeah, who, who else has an opinion? Yeah. I can see them doing that for the individual mm -hmm. more than the school. Yeah. To do like an integrity check. Yeah. Like making someone feel guilty if they lie about how much they actually read on there. Yeah, so you think that they, they do that to make them feel guilty or? No, no, no okay. Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it might build character. Mm -hmm. If if it if it doesn't work, if somebody doesn't report honestly, what what does it is it is it a character degrader? I don't have an answer. I'm just curious what you think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem to affect them. Yeah. In the short term. Yes. But you never know what that's going to do to their character in the long term if they keep getting away with small stuff like that. Right. What they're going to get away with. What they yeah. Get away with so did we did we hurt them or help them? That's the question. It's like, oh, maybe we helped them, maybe we hurt them. It's it's up, it's it's kind of debatable, isn't it? Yes. I'm so Oh, yes. They get to choose. Yeah. See, you raise a really good point. Uh, they don't totally save themselves, do they? Yeah. So the, the, it, it's evident, not necessarily like in an accountability way, because to be blunt, I'm not out there like sorting through your your tests and just trying to see like this person did really bad on the testing, but has a perfect reading report. I suspect that they lied. I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't care that much. Okay. And we'll talk about why I don't care that much, <laughs> but, but you raise a really important, you know, question of like, uh, they get to choose the, the point they get to choose whether it hurts or helps them, you know, and, and maybe you meant that in a grade way, or maybe you meant that kind of in, in an integrity way. You know, um, and we, we will talk about this in the context of the brain in a minute because neuroimaging and neuroscience does actually have something to say about this. Um, and this is just going to be one of those functional essay questions that we're going to talk about. So there isn't much you need to get from this except for just like consider if you like this topic, if this is interesting to you, if you could do a little more reading or research on this and write a two page paper on this topic. That's one of those things you get to decide at the end of this. If you don't like it, you can dismiss it because you're gonna be exposed to five times as many topics as you need. Does that make sense? Some of you are checking out, that's fine. Some of you are excited, engaged, and you might, you might like this as a topic for the discussion. Um, should we have reading reports? Some people like them, I've noticed already. Is there anybody that just doesn't like the idea that we have reading reports? They don't like that they put you in a position to have to choose your own integrity, yes. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. Love it. Yes. I like that perspective. I didn't always feel that way. So, so I, I, I assume that not everybody comes to that naturally because I didn't. But I love that perspective. Anything else? Does anybody absolutely hate them? I've, I've hated them at times. So I don't feel that to be an unusual or, or problematic perspective. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, and we, could, we could go a little Socratic here, okay? Does anybody know what the Socratic method is? We want to really talk carefully about every term before we move forward in the discussion. So we could say something like, what do you mean by 100%? <laughs> is that a simple question? <laughs> it does require a discussion, doesn't it? What about, what about skimming? Does that count? Has, have you ever asked a professor, does, how fast can I read it? <laughs> Seriously, how fast can you read it? Is there, is there, a, is there like a black and white line? Yeah. Right, exactly. So why, you know, I, you know, I have, um, when I was a junior, so I was probably around your guys's range in, at Multnomah, I took a advanced human growth and development class and they had a learning disability specialist come in and wanted to teach us about learning disabilities by testing us. So I got tested and found out, which was not a surprise because I'd had tests as a kid, that I had every learning disability there was. <laughs> and they're rated on a five point scale and I had nine, there's 11, I had, 11, I had nine fives and two fours. <laughs> and again, that doesn't actually have to hold you back and we can talk about that if you guys feel like you struggling ac academically. I'm like the best person to consult with, by the way, because <laughs> I, I still have those. Um, that's why I don't care about small stuff. Um, I just want you to get the big picture. But um, I really related to something you said. What did you say, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's, that's a common experience with, with uh, learning disabilities, too. It's like, what did I just read for the last two pages? Yeah, Am I, or do I not have integrity if I just keep going? Do I have to go back? It's not obvious what, what those lines are, is there, is there? So to me, I view reading as a really complex thing. I don't care what you choose to be your standard, okay? <laughs> I don't care if you choose to read it really fast. I don't care if you choose to read it really slow. Obviously, that's going to affect um, other grades if you take corners that you shouldn't take. I do want you, however, to be able to have um, the right feeling when you're answering it on the test, okay? Does that make sense? And, and we'll talk about that feeling in a minute because we're going to get into the neuroscience of it. And I still don't know how I feel about reading reports. And so your feedback uh, to me would be awesome because you can change my mind. You'd be surprised as a new professor who's never taught a, you know, undergraduate class before how much you could change the way that I do classes if you wanted to. We talked about that before some of you got in here. <laughs> um, so this is a more of a philosophical question, but like, again, I like to be a little Socratic. What, what is a lie? I mean, the definition is not completely obvious to me. And, and when can it be a good choice? Some people in the room are probably going to say never, and some people are going to have a lot of exceptions. Do you guys have any individual feelings on that? There's no right or wrong answer. Yes. I feel like uh, a lot of people's definition of lie can be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you'll have that feeling. You'll have a specific feeling. Yeah. There, there is only one tiny problem that we'll get into in a little bit with the neuroscience. I'm gonna make sure I'm looking at the time. We've got plenty of time. Um, that feeling changes based on a number of factors. And so it's going to be more or less sensitive depending on a certain spectrum that we're gonna talk about. And you have to assess where you are on that spectrum. But we'll get to that in a minute. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, 
That's a good question. I don't know because, again, I can be very Socratic. What do you mean when you say lying? We have to agree on a definition first. And we've had a few people say it's a feeling. And I'm like, that's a problematic definition because feelings respond to your amygdala and your amygdala can be grossly desensitized. So there's, yes. Misleading. Misleading. That mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So it was a good thing in the moment because they don't understand what I'm trying to tell them as like, hey, you're not allowed to do this. It's bad for you. Yeah. So they're trying to ask me why. I can't really explain the answer to them in a way that they will understand. Mm -hmm. So I kind of lie to get them to just understand me. Yeah. Um, but it's, I've noticed over time, though, that they start believing the lie to be true, and then they don't really understand the reasoning for why they shouldn't be doing something. Mm. So it creates more so problems later. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with lying is that you have to remember what you said. And, and to some degree, you have this left frontal cortex, which you don't have to remember what this is. It's OK. Um, it has to like spin some sort of fake reality in your head. It's actually doing a lot of stuff. It's like it's got to generate sensation and images and ideas. And, and then it has to remember this totally separate reality. Um, that's not free. OK, that that's problematic. It's taxing. Um, yeah. We'll build on that too. Um, but when can we all agree, if we can, if most of us can agree, not of all of us will, but when can lying be kind of universally like okay? Yes, your thoughts? Surprises. surprises. Okay, the birthday surprises. I didn't think of that one, but I totally agree. That's the rule in my family. You can totally lie on holidays and Christmases. Okay, anyone's allowed to lie. It's like open season. Okay, maybe most of us agree on that one. What about issues of, of uh, and this is where we might have some differ, but what about issues of unsafety, risk, or danger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. that varies because, like, mm -hmm. you can say that you're lying to protect someone else, and that can yeah. like, that can go bad, that can go wrong, too, like, down the mm -hmm. line. Right. But I think in situations, I feel like it's pretty hard in situations of, like, if you're in danger, yeah. and you're lying to somebody that can be hurting yeah. you, um, like, giving them false information. Right. Like, yeah, but when yeah, people, right. And and it depends on what you mean by, to some degree, like what what is what is danger to you, and and the problem is is that I don't consider interpersonal relationships dangerous, but is that true about someone who's deeply insecure? Will they feel triggered to lie in social situations because they feel like this is threatening? It's an existential or social threat to themselves. And they, they, they have this reaction. I'm not saying that that's good for them. I'm in, that's where, where we have this very arbitrary, subjective definition of danger. And so we don't get to choose how we experience a situation. We don't get to choose what your nerves or your amygdala think is dangerous. That's the important part. Danger is, to some degree, a sensation. We can map into the brain. We can see it. When we hook up a student in a week or so, we'll probably be able to see their anxiety as we're like putting their brain waves on the screen and they'll be able to see like you'll see that like social tension as they feel kind of a little exposed <laughs> and that their their brain waves are all up here for everyone to see. Um, we don't get to decide to some degree what feels dangerous right away. But we do, to some degree, buy our choices. This is a pretty groundbreaking study, um, but the amygdala is a little almond shaped part of your brain. Let's see here. Visual aids here. Little almond shaped spot in your brain right around back here. There's two of them, so they're technically the amygdala, right down here on both sides of the hemisphere of the brain. They are the filter for your fear and fight or flight mechanisms. The problem is, this is, a, this is again a really big problem, that if we get into a pattern of lying and I'm saying it maybe more philosophically like I don't actually like using the word lying because again I don't know what you mean sometimes when people say it but if we get into a, a habit of maybe being defensive and reactive and protective that's maybe a better definition is that fair 
we see that the amygdala actually changes slowly, but it will change to become less sensitive. So we no longer have reactions when we have to fake a reality, when we have to generate something in our left temporal lobe. We can just, nope, that, that's not how the world works. We can, we can pretend over here. And, and we do that when we're lying. And we also just do that when we're not being genuine. Is that fair? Um, so it's, it's complicated. It's not so black and white. Um, but you can map it in the brain. You can see, you know, these red areas are when somebody's telling something that's disingenuine or not true. And uh, the green is a different type of activation for when we're telling the truth. Um, they're very different. We can chart them. We can map them. Um, we have to construct experiences when we aren't genuine or we aren't telling the truth. Um, there's hormones that are different when we, when we are desensitizing our amygdala. When we're desensitizing see, the emotional part of our brain, when we're desensitizing it to fear or to this reaction or to lying, uh, we are releasing something called cortisol. And cortisol changes how our memory works. It changes how our reaction to fear works. Um, and we're releasing something called octocin. You don't need to remember any of this. But the important part is that it's a defensive reflex that makes you more defensive in the world around you. So that if we're really bright and we have really great self-esteem in manipulating the world around us, um, and that's people do develop self-esteem around just manipulating others. It's like I'm just I'm in control. I can I can just, I can just juggle everything. You probably can. You'll get really good at it. Um, but you start to exist in a world with this feeling that things are less safe than they really are. And to some degree, you chose that through a thousand choices. Does that make sense? And so when we aren't speaking our mind or telling the truth, we are sending the wrong impression to our own nervous system. Does that fair? And, and some of us have been doing that for a long time, and some of us sort of do it occasionally, and some of us just really try not to do it. Um, and it's just kind of a spectrum. And, and some of us float in and out throughout our life, and our brain changes back and forth and back and forth. And we get to decide whether we are kind of on the hypervigilant scale or whether we're in this like safe zone where we speak our mind, tell the truth, and we also learn and grow. And that's, that's the big difference between these two states of mind. I don't know if it's gonna be a slide on here or not. Yeah, okay, right, let's talk about this for a second. Speaking our mind and not lying are different. And this is actually maybe more important for the topic. Um, not lying is a much smaller category, isn't it? Speaking your mind is, saying things that you just could choose not to say. It's not a lie of omission. It's just like saying, like, I have this opinion. And this is actually a really complicated part of the class because I want you guys to engage. I want you to tell me when you disagree with me. Um, and I, I think to some degree that takes some risk, right? You have to risk the fact that I might know a lot more about it than you, and there's this fear or concern that I'll be tactless in the way that I correct you. Does that make sense? Which I'll try not to do, obviously. But, but that's why we don't speak up. Um, but what's the cost of not speaking up? We don't learn. We just don't learn. So if we're not in a fear-based world, if we're not in a fight-or-flight world, if we're not in a world that we've unconsciously programmed ourselves to, f to, to be defensive in, we speak our mind more often. And we are wrong more often. But we learn a lot more. And then sometimes the teacher's wrong, and sometimes the other students are wrong, and sometimes you are right, which means that you self righten who you are, but you also might help self righten your community. So that a heavy, uh, defensive, fear, not fear driven, but really, really defensive or controlling nervous system that tries to control everything isn't really wired to learn and change and adapt. It's designed to react. So there's two modes, and you get to choose where you are on that spectrum. And so it, there's lifelong consequences for that because, again, when we're in a defensive position, which we unconsciously tell ourselves every time we don't say the truth, we, 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 we wire ourselves to not learn. Yes? Uh, what mm -hmm. about if you're Yes. So you have a very active amygdala that's very desensitized. It's very sensitive. And, and that, that could be related to a different imbalance. Um, or it could just be that um, 
not that this is necessarily likely, but it could just be that you're the only one telling the truth in a community. <laughs> so you're the only one sensitive to to that kind of control. Does that make sense? You, or, and if you're worried, if your paranoia is focused on like saying, well, I'm really worried that someone thinks I'm lying when I know I'm not lying, um, then there's some other like uh, social insecurities or things that are creeping in that we, like anxiety, yes. Anxiety is really, really complicated. I, as I said, I work in a neuroscience field where I actually do neurological treatments on patients um, I treat complex PTSD and dissociative PTSD. Multiple personality disorder is my specialty. I resolve that and get people back down to one personality. Um, and there's not a lot of people in the world that do that. And so I can tell you a lot about, you know, mental health stuff. That's my field. But that's more like after class. If you want to come ask me, I'm pretty much here after class until like five o'clock usually. And I can do meetings and stuff like that. And and that stuff will come up in class, and we'll work cursorily, curs- you know, just kind of cursory, cursorily addressed it. But, but yeah, we might not be able to get into it, or it might not come up in the book. We'll see. Okay. So speaking your mind is an expression of actually feeling very, very safe in your environment. Uh, there's a problem. You know, not not every way that you speak your mind is is permissible. Uh, and in the real world, to some degree, some people make the argument that it that it is. And that might be true, but you're also in a university that has extra standards that exist, you know, uh, that it exists more con- uh, constraints than the public does, if that makes sense. So we do have to take into account some sensitivity. We expect um, not you to change the content of what you say or the content of what your thoughts are. We want you to put your thoughts out into the world here. But because of the filter and because of the constraints of, like, for example, the disability, the the diversity rules and things like that, you do have to have decency. Does that make sense? Now, decency is just like obvious, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you'd think, but sometimes that's not true. So we do expect every single person to um, be extremely decent in the way that they put their mind out here. Um, if somebody's way off in some problematic ideology, the only way that they're going to come back to reality is by saying it out loud. Does that make sense? And so in a safe place, uh, they can speak their mind. But this isn't just a safe place for them. This is a safe place for other people. Does that make sense? And so there is some regulation around how you speak your mind. So it's a little more nuanced, but you're also college students. We expect you to kind of get that. And um, if anybody is like, say, way outside the bounds uh, of appropriate behavior, I just want you to know that I'll never correct you on a character thing in front of anybody, okay? I will only talk to you after class. If we're talking about like neuroscience stuff and we're talking about facts and we're talking about how the brain works, I might correct somebody on something academic in front of the class, but it's not supposed to be, you know, anxiety provoking. Does that make sense? But if it is something a little more deeper than, than purely academic, I will never correct you in front of your peers. That's, that's a principle that I hold that I think is unhelpful. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So what is telling the truth and when is it important? We talked a little about this with, with uh, uh, you know, speaking your mind. It's more than just telling the truth. It's, it's being honest about who you are and what's on your mind so that you can change and you can grow as a person. Telling yourself that you are safe. It's like putting money in a piggy bank. I want to invest in my own nervous system. I tell the truth so that my body will respond as though I'm safe when I want it to. Otherwise, it might be responding that I'm not safe even when I am. I might be interpreting social situations as an issue of safety because of some of my behavior. Some of it could be trauma, so it might not be your choices. Like as I said, it can be complicated, can't it? But it might be some of my choices that have contributed to the fact that my body thinks I'm not safe when I, when I maybe should be thinking I'm safe. Um, so we do contribute to that. Uh, putting yourself in a learning mode. We, we only learn uh, if we're open to it, and we're only open to it if we make decisions that tell us that we're safe. So if we want everybody to feel safe, if somebody doesn't feel safe in the classroom, come talk to me. I can't, I can't choose how you feel for you, but I can definitely try to accommodate anything that I can to make this a safe environment. Does that make sense? And we sometimes have to intentionally tell the truth or intentionally speak our mind just as an act of resensitizing ourselves to maybe a history of lying. We know that we've desensitized our emotional brain and we want to get back to a sensitivity. So it's time to start saying the truth in front of people who we have judged to be safe. Does that make sense? And that's the hard part because you do take risk. What if this room isn't as safe as we hoped it would be? What if you walk away feeling really negative? It will negatively reinforce 
that behavior and will encourage you to, uh, again, go back to your old patterns. Yes. So I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. I know that um, one thing that I've asked in my life anyway is mm -hmm. talked about what you were. Are, are we born mm -hmm. like with the ability to lie? And it sounds like lying is a reaction of fight or flight. Yeah. So it's kind of like we're born as like liars. Yeah. Does does your body know the world isn't safe? Yeah. We're not taught how to lie or why to lie at first anyways. I think we can just do that. Yeah. But with that being said, does that mean that sometimes we we don't choose whether we lie or not? Because I know in the flight or flight instinct, sometimes your body, your mind kind of takes over and yes. And, and if we if we had a thorough discussion on what we define as a lie, we would probably come to the conclusion that it's a very, very broad definition uh, because it could be, what if you don't feel like you're being genuine to yourself? Is that a lie? Does that count for quality of work? It's like, well, I don't know. It really depends. So yeah, I think I think we could agree on a definition of, that's why I don't like to use the term lie because it's got too much like strict like expectations around it. I, like maybe defensive behavior, you know, <laughs> uh, because when we're in defensive behavior, we're not often as genuine as we should be. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we are, uh, it could be say that we, we are probably born with the ability, the reflex to self-defend and protect ourselves. And that can move into a classic definition of lying pretty easily, which it does for most people. If you have a kid, I don't know if some of you had kids or not, um, kids who have a high IQ, they just learn to lie pretty quickly. Why? Because it's like a magic spell that makes problems go away. It's like, if you ever watched Harry Potter, it's like, done, I fixed something. You know, it's that cool. Kids with high IQ will figure that out pretty quickly. Yeah. So you're pretty much saying that um, lying is always done as a like, defense mechanism? Like well, relative to your experience, um, because... We have this sensation when we're not being truthful. We're not, and that's probably a better statement, or not being genuine uh, or being defensive from our amygdala. But we do choose how sensitive that is by our actions and behavior and by our environment. So if you live in a totally safe environment, which I'm not sure is true, then if you're having a, a reaction in your amygdala, it's because you are giving yourself some false uh, information by the way that you interact with the world. And you probably... To be fair, you probably do that because you weren't always in a safe situation, if that makes sense. Now, maybe people naturally do this, but I, I don't believe that there's anything totally safe in our world. You know, even this classroom, I would like for it to be safe, but I, I don't know that it totally is. I want you guys to choose to be courageous and brave and speak your mind and tell me when you have a thought and tell me when you, you have a concern or a question. Um, so that, that I can learn, so that you can learn, so that, that you can be wrong and learn, so that I can be wrong and learn. It's not about trying to be right as often as you can. It's about trying to be wrong as often as you can so that you can grow as often as you can, and then you'll occasionally, eventually be right more often. And it's, it's not even about being right. It's just about changing and evolving and becoming a better you. That's why you're at college. You're coming here to be wrong as often as you possibly can. <laughs> you know, and, and you, 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 it's not all like front end learning and then getting it right and testing correctly. It's, it's, it's messier than that. And that's how the brain really learns. It's much messier than that. And if it's not messy, then you might not be doing it right. Does that make sense? And I don't know that this concept is something that we teach regularly in any dimension of life yet, but we, I mean, we should, you know, like how do we encourage people to be uh, more um, open about what's on their mind? Does that make sense? That's what we want. <coughs> so, yeah. <coughs> so what do we got? Uh, so we've talked about this. What if I speak my mind and I'm wrong? I was going to bring it today and I just couldn't find it, but I have this solid metal object that when you put it on the ground, it rolls around until it self rightens. And these things are found in nature, some of these, these shapes. So it's a fully dense, it's, a, it's, not, it's not like it doesn't have anything hollow in it, but it self rightens. And I, I might find it and bring it by for another lecture, but, uh, but it self rightens. And that's, that's basically what happens when you start uh, speaking your mind in a safe environment. The safe environment is like the flat surface. And if you speak your mind, you'll self righten You'll orient yourself to the world around you correctly. <coughs> Uh, and we're all deeply wrong on a, a regular basis. Um, we don't know we're wrong. We don't know. I think we, some of us talked about this before class started, but we don't know why we think the way that we think. And we're going to get into that probably in about two weeks uh, where we talk about attention and how 
unbelievably deeply flawed our attention really is. Just to give you a quick preview, um, your optic nerve has a million nerves. You're out, you, you have a million nerves going from one eye. And less than 2% of that information is actually processed by the brain. And you're going to read about that in the next week. There's a specific theorist who, who addresses that. That means the other 90% is just suppressed. You don't even process it. There's a part of your brain, the unconscious part, that just says, this isn't important. So how does your brain pick the 2% that fast? Because it picks it up really, really quickly, and it constructs this whole reality that we experience. Well, how does it do that? Well, what, how, what's not, I mean, it does it, but, but what 2% does it pick? And how, how does it pick it that fast? And the answer is very simple. It picks the 2% that it's looking for. And that's really problematic. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we can even talk about like, I don't know if you guys ever saw like that. What color is this dress? You know, there's all kinds of things that are neurological. We can talk about why that happened. We can talk about the Yuri and Yanni. We can talk about, you know, all those different things. And we can, we can, we can laugh about all the different ones that are out there. And I can explain to you why that happens. Okay. We aren't wired the same way. And we, to some degree, don't get to choose how we're wired. We do over a long period of time. Um, Yeah, we do get over a long period of time, but it is it is it is very complicated, and we don't know what we don't know, and uh, we're going to illustrate that probably in about two weeks, um, and that's going to be probably my favorite topic um, for the class, and I would hope that a lot of you would choose to write on that one, um, because we could spend an entire 16 weeks talking about the problem with attention. <laughs> um, uh, Valentine's Day is going to be my favorite topic for that, so we're going to talk about like how we think matters where we get and we don't know how we think i almost guarantee you we don't know how we think on any topic we haven't put enough thought into it <laughs> all right so open discussion we've probably done a lot of this already in class but how does telling the truth relate to this class how does speaking your mind relate to this class how does telling the truth relate to your personal life how does speaking your mind relate to your personal life um any thoughts anybody want to add anything mm-hmm Mm -hmm. It could affect everything. Yeah. You know, and, and everyone. And then, but sometimes I wonder, you know, am I telling myself the truth? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great and question. <laughs> what somebody else is trying to say. Yes. Or you notice like in a discussion, it's like two people are speaking the same language, but they have no idea what the other person's saying. Yeah, and then you say something to please them. Mm-hmm. Well, well, so there's there's almost like some disingenuous stuff to try to like say, you know, to try to bring it back to something civil. But but at the end, they're really still not understanding each other. You know, so you might be trying to cool tempers um, and you might be doing some mediation between people who are disagreeing. Um, but even that mediation isn't resolving the conflict or isn't resolving the the difference between the way they're interpreting everything. And this is like seeing this in like theological debate or political debate. It's like they have no idea what the other person's saying. Like, how do you have people who spent their entire life in a specific realm of theology or politics and not be able to talk to another person in a way that 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 they can understand each other? It's like we we're different. Go ahead. You could do that. Mm -hmm. This relates to like sales and marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that field because when I would do that, mm -hmm. I would feel like I was manipulating the other person. Yeah. Well, that's that's what a lot of people, yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. Well, and I was talking to a psychologist just yesterday who was talking about well, you have to pretend to agree with them in order to change their mind. So you have to like subvert their camp. And it was like, what? That can't be the answer. That's so unsatisfying. I won't, I won't accept that, you know? And so I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I lean more towards making everything a little more Socratic. I want every definition to be discussed really carefully before the discussion proceeds. We don't have time to do that in class because we could take a really simple topic. Maybe we will at one point just for kicks and we'll take 90 minutes and we'll talk about something really, really simple and we'll define everything as we go before we move on to the next statement. Um, and that's really complicated, but it does get two people to have a real discussion without um, unfair interpretation without any kind of cognitive fallacy or logical fallacy or um, thinking errors because I mean we do it without knowing yeah I find that that's almost impossible in my life 
Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Right. Well, and, and one of the practical essays is going to be about why we can't do that and or why it's unbelievably hard. And, and I think there's a certain amount of humility um, when you study the brain, you realize like, it's amazing we can communicate it all um, because we are so focused on our agenda that we read, or I would say orientation. So how we're oriented affects how I interpret everything you say when all you care about is how you're oriented and neither one of us have the ability to reach deep enough into the other person's heart and make a change. Um, and we see what we want to see. You know, and I, I gave a literal example of like visual, but it works that way in all the other dimensions as well. What if you only process 2% of the information? Do you get to choose how you see the world? Yeah, you do. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> it's not exactly unbiased. Um, so let's see here. The first practical essay uh, topic is why do we tell the truth? So just to give you some context, does anybody feel like that would be hard to write two pages on? We'll talk more about this. So you're, before we, when you actually have to write this, we'll have brought it up a few more times, okay? But how do you guys feel? Is it like okay or is it nervous or is it exciting or is it okay? It's good? Okay. So that's... That's basically uh, the gist of it. For the last five minutes, we're going to go over a quick YouTube video. Okay. Does anybody know who Richard Feynman is? He is a um, physicist. I love physicists. As we're going to find out when we go over the neuroanatomy class, I'm going to bring in some actual props to illustrate why the brain forms brain waves. There was a big scientific breakthrough about three weeks ago. Um, that I just, you know, face palmed because it should have been obvious. But when you look at the world through a physicist lens, the brain makes way more sense than if you just study neurology. And this is going to be um, not really related so much to neurology, but I want you to think about and maybe discuss for the last minute why this relates to studying the brain. Okay. If you get hold of two magnets and you push them, you can feel this pushing between them. You turn it around the other way and, it, and they slam together. Now. What is it, the feeling between those two magnets? What do you mean, what's the feeling between well, the two th magnets? there's something when you're there, isn't there? I mean, that, the sensation is that there's something there when you push these two magnets together. Listen to my question. What is the meaning when you say that there's, that there's a feeling? Of course you feel it. Now, what do you want to know? What I want to know is what's going on the between these two, bits, these two bits of metal. The magnets repel each other. And, well, then, what does, that, but what does that mean? Or why are they doing that? Or how are they doing it? Uh, you're asking. I, I, I must say, I think that's a perfectly reasonable question. Of course, to it's ask. a reason. It's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, the, but the problem that you're asking, you see, when you ask why something happens, how does a person answer why something happens? For example, Aunt Minnie is in a hospital. Why? Because she slipped. She went out and she slipped on the ice and broke her hip. That satisfies it, people. It satisfies, but it wouldn't satisfy someone who came from another planet and knew nothing about things. You first, you should understand why, when you break your hip, do you go to the hospital? How do you get to the hospital with the, when the hip was broken? Well, because her husband, seeing that she had the hip was broken, called the hospital up and sent somebody to get her. All that is understood by people. Now, when you explain a, a why, you have to be in some framework that you allow something to be true. Otherwise, you're perpetually asking why. Why did the husband call up the hospital? Because husband is interested in his wife's welfare. Not always. Some husbands aren't interested in their wife's welfare when they're drunk and they're angry. And so you begin to get a very interesting understanding of the world and all its complications. In order to, to, if you try to follow anything up, you go deeper and deeper in various directions. If, for example, you could go, well, why did she slip on the ice? Well, ice is slippery. Everybody knows that. No problem. But you ask, why is ice slippery? That's kind of curious. Ice is extremely slippery. It's very interesting. You say, how does it work? You could, you see, so you could either say, I'm satisfied that you've answered me. Ice is slippery. That explains it. Or you could go on and say, why is ice slippery? And then you're involved with something because there aren't many things as slippery as ice.
It's very hard to get. Greasy stuff, but that's sort of wet and slimy. But a solid that's so slippery? Because it is in the case of ice that when you stand on it, they say, momentarily the pressure melts the ice a little bit, so you got a sort of instantaneous water surface on which you're slipping. Why on ice and not on other things? Because ice expands when it, water expands when it freezes, so the pressure tries to undo the expansion and melts it. It's capable of melting it. But other substances contract when they're freezing, and when you push them, they're just as satisfied to be solid. Why does water expand when it freezes and other substances don't expand when they freeze? All right? I'm, I'm not answering your question, but I'm telling you how difficult a why question is. You have to know what it is that you're permitted to understand and allow to be understood and known and what it is you're not. It goes on and on and on. You're welcome to watch it. That's uh, Richard Feynman Magnets um, on YouTube. Just trying to have the kids. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Well, that's the fascinating thing about kids. I won't take up more of your time because we need to go in about one minute. But kids, we do just say, because that's the answer. And they learn to stop asking, which is why we don't ask, why does ice melt? Or why, does, why is ice slippery? When, when you haven't been presented to something when you were a child, like neurons and brain waves and, and connectomes and, and all the different things that we're going to cover, you're all going to want to ask why, 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 why. That's totally fine. You'll be surprised how deep I can go if you want. But the problem is that it doesn't satisfy because you can't relate it to anything. And that's, that's why it's like, well, how do, we, how, do we, how do we feel good about this? And it's like, some of you might not be able to. I will try to make this class as practical as I can. If, if you go through all the neuroscience and neuroanatomy and you love it, then you should go to grad school and apply for an internship at my company, okay? <laughs> because that's not normal, okay? <laughs> but, but it's not very relatable. Um, and that's okay. It is what it is. We're going to do what we can to make it easier. I wanted you to be exposed to just a little bit of that so that you can understand why it's so hard to ask why, okay? And why this class is harder. It's not more information in this class than other classes. It's just less relatable, okay? Is that fair? All right. Any questions before we go? All right. Well, I'm staying after if anybody has any questions, okay? Thanks.